Dragon's Dogma 2 is at its best when, well, honestly, most of the time. But why is it great is the most important question, because as with all games, its style, presentation, and gameplay may not be for you. So sit back and let's discuss what makes Dragon's Dogma 2 special, and thanks to Capcom for the code. Also, occasionally random pawns throughout the community are going to show up in this video. If you get a chance, try to guess them all, and I'll throw you into the normal pool for commenters and subscribers for winning the game. While everyone is busy in this world, it'd be really nice if you were here for the score alone to maybe just let the video play. 80 plus hours plus another 10 for editing seems to be worth 20 minutes of time. And speaking of time, if you want to jump in the Discord, we will be streaming this all throughout the week. Bunch of different people coming in, as always, discussing the game behind the scenes, and I'll be answering anybody's questions. Dragon's Dogma 2 starts quickly enough with a small interlude and then you leap into one of the best character generators in gaming so far. Regardless if you choose a human or a beast man, the game has settings and sliders for pretty much everything, and the recent demo of it showed just how crazy the creations can be. Want to make a damned monster looking human? Go for it. Vin Diesel from Pitch Black? Yep. But you can also now make one of the beastrun races. Originally planned for the first game, they're finally here, and surprisingly look less like humans with kitten heads and instead merges the two races well enough to look natural. At least in so much as Dragon's Dogma 2 ever looking natural. Kid them out with scars, complexion issues, make them fat as hell, skinny like a rail, huge, small, it's all there. After that, you leap into the game proper. Without any real spoilers, in many ways, Dragon's Dogma 2 opens with the same resonance as the first game, but truncated, cutting out the dirty little villa location that was so boring in the first game, and starts it actually in the same way the first game did at an outpost battle, a larger one here, and then a trip that was more like Dragon's Dogma 1 when it really started to show its systems and its prowess. It's a better way to start by a good measure, In the game's occasional uses of flashbacks helps actually flesh out a story with an alternate world where two Arisens have arised. Gameplay in Dragon's Dogma is also a truer reflection of the focus they expect players to employ, and that's the simple strategies of technique, knowledge, and time. While on cursory examination it may sound like a trite example that the developers have given, the idea is that the players will come at the title in one of those three ways, or of course, as they continue to play, a combination of them. It's not really anything new. However, Dragon's Dogma 2 may be one of the few games where almost every single decision made and the way you set your character up, or that can't be made, plays out across those three strategies. It's a game that entices in the initial offerings of combat, but then interlaces that with truly interactive HUDs in the form of the pawns, and then adds to that the reward for exploration across those other two facets. Let me explain them for a second. With technique meaning heavy skill use and mastering of the combat tactics and the tighter vocations, a player focused more on the martial prowess than marching across the world or spending time munching meals with pawns and learning about the world through them. While some changes have been made to the vocations, it's still ultimately a set of classes, then advanced classes, and then hybrid classes with skills that get unlocked with class points, as well as passive perks. Upgrading and changing these aren't hard at all, as you quickly unlock the ability to do so at any vocation trainer after some quests. A knowledge-based player will come at this game slightly different, hiring pawns who know about the world and the quests, who may have explored prior, who may be of higher level, understanding the weaknesses and strengths of enemies, and not pushing into situations that the player can't get out of because they entered into it without any of that information. All pawns have their own skills and attitudes, which can be adjusted using purchased items as well. In addition, smart understanding of the time of day and the resources needed for a trip to a quest location become vital for this kind of player. To the developers, a time-based player is closer to the time-honored tradition of grinding money and times of leveling up the character, to the point where perfect skill use, higher, more expensive pawns are less important than a player that looks like they bedazzled themselves with max-level armors and weapons and give off a magical glow enemies can see like a second sun coming over the rise. The expectation here is that almost nobody will be able to facilitate all three right away, at least not until an incredible amount of time within the game has been put down. And the developers have hit it perfectly. For example, a combat-based player, it's not about locking or parrying, it's about moving and magic, about sliding between two goblins to take down their armored best friend, and then whipping up a storm and trailer park in an entire enemy camp. Vocations are indeed tighter than the original game, with more powerful moves as you advance, but their focuses have shifted a bit to class specifics. And it's also still a stamina-based game, with a number of afflictions, statuses, and specials. There's almost no one who can't find a vocation that's going to fit them, even if everyone wants to take the more advanced classes and try to buff pawns or use illusions to lure enemies onto spectral bridges and then watch them fall to their deaths. While knowledge-based players and the pawn system are truly well thought out here, offering pawns that are awarded badges for knowledge, exploration, and monsters downed, building their own abilities for those elements above and beyond just sheer battle prowess. 
This makes them an integral part of the HUD and MAP system, as pawns who've completed missions can lead you more easily back to them, which can be the difference between stumbling out into a game world where many times the map just says, something's happening over here, and gives you a massive swath of land to investigate. It's an elegant system that quickly becomes second nature, even if you're using it as a third option. And lastly, the game's just chock full of merchants, traveling and hold up in ruins or major cities, selling wares all kinds for you to buy, then enhance to impact your character's main stats. Mixing and matching herbs in your inventory, then selling them or combining their buffs with special armors and weapons lets players who just want to grind it out pretty much do so, unless they find themselves staring down the shorter and shorter line of a carry weight system that turns even the fastest character into a trudging fatty if you carry too much. In my gameplay, I've focused on one or the other. I've mixed and matched them at different times, taking down enemies I shouldn't have been able to with a smart mix of double pawn, spell casting, and potions that kept me topped off regardless of how hard the enemies hit. I've also ground down areas of enemies and taken their parts back and enhanced weapons and made myself hundreds of thousands of coins just based on being a homicidal maniac. But regardless of which of the tactics you take, there's simply no denying a couple things. The first is a shared lineage between this game and Monster Hunter. Dragon's Dogma 2, like a cousin who comes to live with a family after some terrible other event, familiar but always a bit alien at the same time. These moments aren't just in collecting items from dead bodies, but in the verticality that pervades everything in Dragon's Dogma 2. Like the first time, a 25-foot-tall rampage inversion of Black Death on two legs rip-snorted through a village and my team of trustworthy walking versions of YouTube comments had to take him down. And you also have villagers who'll spend the afternoon trying to kill it. Sure, it's about as futile as a bunch of wolves trying to eat a friggin' iceberg, but still looked really cool. And while they were doing that, I got to circle around and hit him with a special move. And during these times, it's hard not to see the similarities. But it becomes this fantastic ballet of stamina, steel, and monster teeth if the ballet dancers wore middle-aged armor and were related to Merlin. It's also about the tactics for those specific enemies or those locations. For instance, the Lizardmen will moonwalk right the fuck out of your attack range when you start doing damage, and chasing them becomes its own minigame as they lead you past one of their allies, who then turns and spits at you, slowing you down. So you turn to attack that new enemy, and now the one you were just chasing spits poison at your back again. It's like the part in Empire Strikes Back when Darth Vader just kept throwing random shit at Luke's back. Those glorious moments of strategy and understanding movement and enemy patterns plays out across the whole world, and in the open world, really shows an increased feature of the terrain and location props that we saw in the original game. For example, boulders are still here, but they're much more often. If you spy Cyclops at the bottom of the hill, you can just sneak past and maybe find a massive boulder to roll down onto him, or other interactions that I'm not going to say now to stop from spoiling, but they just continue to impress and merge the worldview, the way you play, and the atmosphere together in a way other games don't. It doesn't just leave you with a character that, say, takes 15 seconds to cast a freaking fire spell, but it also offers you the ability to synergize with the other spellcasters, casting that same spell faster. This also means that a party makeup can look really unique depending on situations, and something that you can switch out often because pawns are all over the game world. Something I want to talk about in a second. The same goes for choosing the harder-hitting vocations or the more martial ones. For instance, switching from fighter to warrior isn't just losing the shield and replacing it with a two-handed weapon the size of a card door, it's adding a ton of buffs and resistances. For example, a warrior flatly doesn't give a shit about being hit when attacking, and the ability to get staggered and knocked down considerably drops, which means that changing a weapon isn't just about the hit and the ability to soak, but the ability to wade in and just not be affected at all during attacks, which also means you can command others more accurately. Also, it's about the atmosphere. Dragon's Dogma 2 might be the game with the best day-night cycle and world atmosphere merging that I've seen. Crest in a hill in the dead of night with a small circle of thrown off light from that lantern at your waist, and seeing the embers of a small fire glowing in the distance, there's this tentative moving towards and consistently at alert feeling that starts to grow. Is it a goblin camp, or is it just the politeness of past travelers to leave a fire smoldering? And for a game like Dragon's Dogma, which is, I would say, somewhat on the unemotional side when it comes to the story and almost a detached feeling to everything, especially with the way the pawns react, there's a great deal of emotion that the game actually ends up delivering. For example, four dead, tired pawns dragging weapons behind them, exhausted from three afternoon battles. As his darkness descends around you, the light collapses to nothing more than that 15-foot radius of vague enemy location. Pockets of safety in a world that's absolutely punishing. Then two small dots of blue show up in the distance, rocking back and forth. And for a second, you think to yourself, oh, maybe that's just the two blue flower petals that illuminate at night. And then, nope, it's two skeletons. And trust me, too, is four times too many if you haven't rested in a while, as you can only regain your true ability and health back 
if you end up resting. Skeletons just flatly don't give a shit if you pound it into separate pieces because until you find their head and crush it like a Terminator movies, these guys are just going to reassemble sentient, hate-filled Lego blocks and kick the living shit out of you. And that's just one example. There's an almost melancholic brilliance here, a sense of a pervading loneliness, even with the pawns that seeps through everything. As you continue to adventure, and with every single quest and more exploration, it flows out into the world around you, movie-like almost, or dare I say, a little bit like Dark Souls, in that feeling of solitude even when other characters are there, with the pawns replacing some aspects of the HUD, as well as the lore dumps and the occasional characters you might meet. Each one is a smattering of one-liners about locations, creatures, and otherwise. And that means despite the game having a party system and despite it having cities, there's still this awesome feeling of solitude that I love. However, there's a couple things I don't love, and that's especially when you're playing with a controller. Dragon's Dogma 2's biggest weakness continues to be their strict romance with the B button on consoles. I assume these guys are just laying out a bed of roses and a bottle of Arkansas's finest $3 wine for a date night with a B button. You hold it to talk, click it to pick up stuff, hold it again to resurrect pawns. In combat, it's notoriously fickle when added to the system that doesn't have any lock on, which I like but also means that at time you're fighting with a camera, trying to pick up a needed drop while also trying to not resurrect your pawn because that takes too long. That being said, Dragon's Dogma 2 hits where the first one did, but is much larger, mostly more polished, and continues the tradition that started with the original. The combat feels wide open with your own moves, the pawns and the ability for random monsters to leap into already frenzied engagements means that fights are always interesting, and the way everything interacts together is profoundly enjoyable. Graphically, the game continues in its humble origins. There's something very layman-like about the way Dragon's Dogma has always presented itself. Initially, a lot of browns mixed with prairies and forests, but still a lower-level magical style, despite the gigantic spells you may be casting later on. Also, a larger world. So when you start out in the slave pits, there's a really good chance somebody's really nice castle isn't going to be built three feet from it. And instead, there's initial layering of travel between locations and this massive spreading out, changing between rural and urban that grows with each location and builds to make travel not only a true delight, but something that continually tantalizes the senses as you look just over one more hill and you see some shiny new location or possibly some hidden loot and really deep and most likely dangerous cave entrance that you want to go to. The tuft of dirt and soil under your feet or the soft glow of flowers that only bloom at night and sparkle around their stems means there's still a magical feel to everything, but it's also grounded. What I wish wasn't so grounded and lifted a little bit higher was the performance. What frustrates me so much about Dragon's Dogma 2 is that ray tracing or not the performance of the game, it was solid enough when exploring and fighting, but I saw some heavy drops in cities, which is sort of disappointing because really, they aren't that complex. And especially on a 4090 and a new i7, you should be seeing better FPS than this and certainly shouldn't be seeing the drops in some of these spots. Now on PC, the game's options let you turn ray tracing on or off, it also has support for FSR as well as DLSS and a number of options. Also, I got to point out right away, Bloom really does do something strange. So you may notice that sometimes in the footage when I was testing everything. It's really not that good and probably something you should turn off right away. It's because Dragon's Dogma loves to lace fog and smoke and particle effects everywhere. And Bloom in this game has a tendency to just blow the picture out. Where in the nighttime, it delivers a nice soft ethereal glow at campsites that adds to the air of mystery and fantasy. During the day, it's just much less attractive. On the consoles, the frame rate can also be all over the place. Those with variable refresh rate systems can turn that on, but be aware, it is noticeable. The view distances, size of the world, and general activity level in the game is grander than the original by far, many times larger. But still, would have been nice to see a locked 30 versus something this variable. So if you're a pixel peeper, be prepared to see some stuff. I also had a couple bugs. I had pawns, especially stuck in walls and stalls. Luckily, they teleport right to you as you continue to move on. I had monsters ass hammering the side of a wall to get to the villagers on the other side, blissfully unaware of the solid structure in front of them for a good deal of time. When it comes to audio, the presentation is a good deal better than the original, especially with pawns having a huge number of comments about the world, quests, party makeup, and more. Sometimes they'll discuss their last master choice of all beastmen party members, or how everyone likes to smash the crap out of everything, regardless if they're being attacked. Other times, call into attention what they're doing or what they can do, and a quick button press from you tells them to go do it. It's a nice little combo system there. Musically, it's a subdued affair like the original and right up my alley with a soundtrack that sits well back from the action many times, just a soft backdrop in an otherwise harsh world. 
Sound-wise, it's also excellent, with very easy tracking of enemies far and wide during battle. Completely off-screen, you can still usually hear an enemy attacking, as well as excellent directional sound when trying to identify where a pawn is, or who's calling for you, or who wants to use Levitate to get up to a chest somewhere. When it comes to everything coming together, and is it fun, for all the highlights and the praises I can sing, let me just say this. Sure, there are other games that have made some of the same choices, but it's rare, outside of, say, just Dark Souls-style titles, to see it working so well. Yeah, sure, if football was invented by some random guy, but it takes an amazing quarterback to turn it into an efficient tool. And for the second time, Dragon's Dogma's creators are those quarterbacks. And without hesitation, I can say this is worth buying. Dragon's Dogma's team has always been about fun between locations, about that experience across the breadth of a landscape, here massively larger. It's a busier world than the original in many places, but the world that is filled with nooks and crannies that always reward exploration. But it's also that darker worldview, and the fact that while some options have their weaknesses, it's how they drive the world itself that matters. A worldview, again, reflected in the restricted fast travel system with port stones, returning from the original game. Rare items that make it very difficult to just bounce around the game world unless you want to pay for it. So if you're like me who hates the repetitive location sprawling runs like Lord of the Rings if the hobbits just kept running back to Hobbington, that's reduced. And then somewhat even more because you can now do ox carts that transport you between the big cities. They have their own risks like being attacked and left for dead. Also, the game does have some really annoying ideas that pop up the more you play. Pawns and switching them out is the name of the game here as they don't progress in levels aside from the main one. I'm fine with that. Finding stones across the game world is pretty easy and that's where you switch them out. However, pawns are also around the game world walking, and they're some needy bitches, and consistently interrupt you to sell their services even at the worst of times, and even when you aren't focused on them at all, or haven't clicked on them, and this can happen on a trail in the middle of a battle. But the best parts of this game destroy any of those problems, a game where a 30 minute fight with a minotaur results in a pawn muttering, the beast is dead, and the world's laziest high five. It's workmanlike in its atmosphere even when you have others with you. Sure, you're the Risen, and someone rumbles, great dude, but what have you done for me lately, and sends you on a quest, but it strangely makes a celebration of an enemy's defeat all the sweeter, because instead of a cutscene or even a Dark Souls-like return to a bonfire, Dragon's Dogma 2 is like a subtle nod from a football coach at a job well done. It's an appealing mix of sweaty moments punctuated by pure discovery. Isn't perfect? Far from it. Not everyone is going to love this kind of high-stakes gameplay decision that the series makes, which is an odd meandering between multiple systems and multiple styles. But what it is, is one of the most fun games I've played in 2024. Full stop. Subscribe. Check out the patron. Peace out. Our packs are heavier, and our purses far lighter. These were necessary expenses, mind. No use clinging to every last coin. It seems Sir Roderick is the one to talk to. Shall we go and speak with him? I know where that person can be found, Master. This way. A guide is most welcome. Now we shan't lose our way. My curative magics are at your disposal. Wait right there. One of us has been trapped. Where would I be without you, Arisen?